Welcome to the third lesson in the area of study three section. Uh, today we'll be having a look at kinematics. Um, so welcome along, hope you enjoy the lesson and that you learn something new. Let's start off with what we're gonna do. So we're gonna have a look at what's the purpose of kinematics. So why do we have it? What's it useful for? Uh, we're gonna have a quick recap of all the formulae that you need to know. Uh, we're going to have a look at what I call the kinematics approach, uh, which is a proven way uh, to attack those kinematics questions. And then we're going to have a look at uh, projectile motion in a little bit more depth. We're going to look at uh, horizontal, vertical and oblique projection. All right, a little bit of an introduction. So kinematics allows us to do a few things. It allows us to predict where objects will land, how far away, at what speed and so on. Um, and it allows us to verify our observations with reference to these formulae. Um, and because kinematics is only about, uh, I guess, the path of the object, it doesn't require us to uh, describe the forces behind it. So it's quite useful in that way. Uh, it allows us to draw conclusions about the reliability of our predictions. And so it allows us to discuss appropriate models of motion so that we can refine them. Um, so it's a really good way of explaining the motion of objects within certain parameters. Uh, and really those four points make up an excellent lab work material um, to create an experiment. So pretty much here we can make a hypothesis. Here's our experiment. Uh, here's our evaluation and here's our conclusion. Uh, so it's really, it is quite useful and that's why it's so popular uh, within the VACA study design to have um, your experimental, your practical investigation at the end of the year on kinematics. All right, the formulae. Uh, if you had a look at the first lesson, you would have seen these before. They are identical. Um, we have these formulas here, uh, pretty straightforward. You would have learned them in one, two if you did it. Uh, so we've got um, the basics is probably the most used along with maybe those two and the other two. Uh, tend to be a little less used, uh, at least in my experience, but um, a core component of the study design is the application of these formulas to constant acceleration. Uh, and the other thing to note is that acceleration must be constant in all of these. Uh, there isn't really another, uh, I guess, different way of attacking questions with constant acceleration, so you'll always be using these formulas. Okay, the kinematics approach. This is what I've kind of uh, crafted along with a few others who did quite well in physics. It's a really, really good way of approaching kinematics questions and tends to work quite well. Um, so these, these are the steps, I'll just read them out. Allocate part of your cheat sheet to derivations of formulas that make the working out quicker. Uh, so you may find, I certainly found um, formulas that help me reach a solution fast without having to do a whole derivation on my own page. Uh, and the way that you end up doing those is you end up doing questions that ask you to do different kinds of things uh, within kinematics. And you take your uh, final formula, I guess, and put that on your cheat sheet where it isn't the same uh, as all the other formulas. So that can be quite useful. Uh, it's a bit of a cheat really to uh, doing the paper faster. Use those formulas in practice paper, papers and ensure that they always work. So for me, um, that meant once I put them on the cheat sheet, <clears throat> I would use them in uh, all my practice papers. And so what that meant was I would be able to make sure um, that there wasn't an issue with the formula uh, and that provided I got the right answer, I could be confident that I could take those into the exam and use them. The key to answering any of these questions is to identify which formula is the most appropriate. To, so to source a relevant result. So a lot of people tend to take a long route and use two or three different formulas to get the result. And while it's correct, uh, it doesn't necessarily result in the fastest answer. And it certainly means that you're wasting time, essentially. Work your way backwards from what is asked as some questions require multiple steps of working. So sometimes you'll be asked uh, to say, Find a, find a certain quantity, whether it's velocity or displacement, um, but you may require to find the time along the way, for instance, um, so that you can find that end result. 
and that's particularly appropriate when it comes to oblique motion and you've got motion in two different directions and you'll find that out a little bit later on this lesson. Check your answer using a different formula as all answers should be the same. So because all of the five formulas uh, on, that, on that list are pretty much derivations of each other, um, they should all result in the same answer. If you get a different answer, it means that there's a mistake along the way. So it's really easy checking me mechanism. Uh, and as you do it more and more, you get faster and faster at it. Uh, so it's a really good way to go back at the end of the paper. Uh, if you weren't 100% sure, certainly go back, use a different formula and try it again. Never assume that your initial working is correct. Kinematics is very easy to make a numerical mistake, especially entering values into your calculator. So that often is the downfall of a lot of people. They make a silly mistake somewhere on uh, in the question, early on, late on, somewhere in the middle, doesn't really matter, but they make a mistake and they carry that mistake forward uh, so they can't get the right answer. So it's really easy um, to work, uh, work through the question a couple of times just to make sure that all your working is correct. <clears throat> um, with regards to those cheat formulas, um, if you like an example of those, uh, you can contact me uh, via the Ellen's website and I should be able to provide you with a derivation and some examples of how some of those formulas work. Okay, a bit of content. Kinematics in one dimension, we'll start with the vertical. Uh, examples can include throwing a ball up and down, um, a lift going up and down, a parachutist obviously going down, uh, a helicopter going up and down, um, and all of these examples are under the influence of gravity for their motion. Uh, so with that, you'll always, not always, but sometimes you get a, a lifting force. So that may be, for instance, the helicopter blades lifting uh, the helicopter up, or it might be the cable and lift lifting it up, but you'll also have the influence of gravity in this situation. So you may require Newton's second law um, to get the acceleration of the object. Okay, practice question one. A ball is projected upward with an initial velocity of 35 meters per second. A sensor on a beam sits 50 meters directly above the projection point with a light attached as shown. Using relative relevant calculations, explain whether the ball will hit the sensor. Three marks, you've got three minutes, pause the video and get back to it once you're done. Okay, now that you've had a go at doing practice question 1A, uh, let's see how I would do it. So this is what I, this is what I would write on my page. I'd say, um, what I'm trying to do is show whether the maximum height is more than or less than 50 meters. Um, so I'm gonna have all of my initial conditions. So we have the initial velocity here, uh, we've got the displacement, uh, but that's only for later. So this is for this value here. Uh, we've also got um, the acceleration is gravity. And I'm defining upwards as positive. So it'll be uh, negative 9.8. And we also know that at the maximum height, the velocity is going to be zero. That's why I've got that last bit. Now we have to choose a useful formula. Um, so I want displacement, so I'm going to have something that has S in it, because um, that's what I want to find. But I'll also have a formula that has all of these three things and no time, because time, we want to eliminate as many variables as we can. So we're going to substitute all these values in, like so. Uh, so zero is 35 squared minus 2 by 9.8 by S. And you get 19.6 S is 1,225. And solving for S gives you 62 and a half meters, which is more than 50 meters. Now this line here is perhaps the most important um, because it means that if the height is more than 50 meters, it will hit the sensor. So as the maximum height, if there was no beam in the way is more than 50 meters, the ball will collide with the sensor. Okay, practice question 1B. To have the light illuminate to maximum capacity, the ball must hit the sensor at no less than 20 meters per second. Find the minimum initial velocity that will result in the light illuminating to maximum capacity. Two marks, so you get a couple of minutes to do this question. Uh, you can pause the video and come back to it once you've done the question.
Okay, now that you've had an opportunity to do that question, uh, let's see what I do. A bit similar to last time, I'm going to write out everything I know. So the minimum velocity at the end is going to be 20. So I'll write that down there. It comes from there. Uh, the displacement's the same, so it's going to be 50, and acceleration is going to be the same. So it's going to be under gravity, so it's going to be minus 9 pi meters per second squared. Again, happen to use this formula again. Um, you don't necessarily have to, um, but it's probably the best one to choose. Um, unless you want to find time and then use V equals U plus AT. Um, so this is kind of, again, choosing the most appropriate formula. Substitute all those values in. Make sure that you're not substituting um, the V as the U or vice versa. Uh, that's also a pretty common mistake. Um, what ends up happening is to get that you get u squared, uh, or you'd get v squared as a completely different value in this case. Um, so it's rearranging to make u squared the subject. And you get u is about 37 meters per second upwards. Um, because I've asked for velocity, must have upward on it uh, or towards the sensor uh, because it asks for a vector essentially. Okay, the beam is moved another 20 meters higher, such that the total distance from the sensor to the projection point is 70 meters. The sensor will fail if the impact speed of the ball on the sensor is more than 30 meters per second. Find the maximum projection speed so that the sensor will not fail and find the flight time from launch to impact in this case. Four marks, so it's got a couple of parts to it. Uh, so you've got four minutes. Good luck, get back to it uh, when you finish the question. All right, now that you've had an opportunity to do this question, uh, let's see what I would do. I would write out all my initial conditions again. So we've got the maximum speed this time, is 30. Uh, we've got the total distance as 70. And we've got gravity again there. So those are the three uh, things that we know. So let's again happen to choose that formula. Um, just seems to be these types of questions that I've written. Um, so we'll substitute all the values in. Um, so we get 30 squared is u squared minus 19.6 times 70. I've just here, I've just gone two times a already. Uh, you might wish to have an extra line of working, it's up to you. Um, so then we get u squared is uh, an ugly-ish number, uh, 2,272. Uh, so you get about 48 metres per second, of course. Remember that this can be to a maximum of two significant figures, your answer, because that's the most that we have uh, in the question. Now, separately, we need to find the time. So we have U, now that we've found it, we have V, up here and we've got a here so we can find the time uh, and make sure that when you are using a value again uh, that it's to more significant figures than you require um, because otherwise sometimes you get a slightly different answer and the assessor will mark it wrong you can never get it wrong in this case when you're using closest to the exact answer um, so this is to four decimal places or six significant figures um, so that should hypothetically uh, give you enough to make sure that's correct. And then you rearrange to get 1.8 seconds. Um, so in terms of mark allocation for this question, because it's a bit of a, a multi-part question, you probably have one mark here or between these two steps for the correct formula and the correct substitution, uh, and you get a mark here, the answer for the, the uh, initial uh, projection speed. Now note, because it's speed, you don't need a direction. Then you have another one, one mark between these two steps here for the uh, correct formula and the correct substitution, and another mark here, so that's your four marks. Okay, kinematics in one dimension, still in one dimension, but this time uh, horizontally. So examples include a vehicle accelerating or decelerating, a person speeding up or slowing down during a race, a crate slowing down on a rough surface. So there are lots of examples that you can think of uh, along the horizontal plane. Um, but with those, because it's only in the horizontal um, 
an external force has to be applied um, because gravity is countered at least partially by the normal reaction force. Um, so we'll often get, uh, let's say, uh, a car, the engine provides a force, uh, a person, so their feet on the ground produce the force, and for the crate, it would be the friction provides the retarding force. Um, so th those are the kind of the key points for horizontal motion. Um, let's do another question. Okay, so Isaac is driving a locomotive of total mass 14,000 kilograms. On his way to the train yard to pick up some carriages, the locomotive exerts a driving force on the train tracks of 7,250 newtons, in addition to a frictional force of 250 newtons acting against the direction of motion. If the locomotive starts from rest, find the distance it travels after 20 seconds. Uh, three uh, marks, so about three minutes. Uh, you can pause the video and get back to it after you've done the question. All right, now that you've had an opportunity to do that question, uh, let's see what I'd do. Now, the first thing, very important, draw a free body diagram. So you mightn't have time to draw as pretty a train as that, um, but even if you just drew a, a square, something that represents the object uh, and draw a couple of arrows, you know what forces are acting on it. And so from that, we can use Newton's second law. Um, just a note quickly with those arrows, they aren't to scale because if they were, then either you wouldn't be able to see the 250 Newton one or the 7,250 Newton one would be off the page. So I haven't drawn it to scale. Generally speaking, it was assessed. Um, I don't assess your rough diagrams per se. Um, then you'd lose a mark for that. But I'm not concerned because this is just an example. Uh, so the sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. Uh, and that sum of those forces is going to be uh, 7,250 minus 250, uh, and that's equal to 14,000 A. Uh, from that, uh, pretty straightforward between those two steps, we simplify that to 7,000, and 7,000 divided by 14,000 is a half. Uh, we could give a, a, a direction to that, um, but that's not what the question asks for, it asks for the distance. Um, so we're just gonna use our formulas uh, we know that it starts from rest, it says it does, so u is going to be zero, um, and so we can substitute all that in. So s is going to be zero, uh, plus half by half uh, by 20 squared, and we get 100 metres, nice round 100 metres. All right, practice question three, again a, a different train, uh, is accelerating along a 150 metre stretch of track. Calculate the time it takes for the train to travel along this section if the final velocity of the train is seven meters per second and the train is initially traveling at one meters per second. There's two marks, uh, so you get a couple of minutes to do it. Um, pause the video and come back when you're ready. Okay, now that you've had an opportunity to do this question, let's see what I would do. First is to select an appropriate formula. Uh, now, this is what I've chosen. Um, this is, again, straight from those formulas because it has V. The final velocity has got U and it's got S. And most importantly, it has the time, which is what we want to find. So again, it's about choosing the right formula. Um, some people may uh, try to find the acceleration and then use a different formula, but this is surely the easiest way to do it. Uh, so you rearrange. Uh, that formula. So what we'll do is we'll, mu we'll multiply the two across uh, and we'll divide by u plus v. And so we get this. That's just simply a rearrangement. Um, and then we can substitute the values in. All that. There we go. So it's going to be 2 by 150 uh, divided by 1 plus 7. And uh, that simplifies to 38 seconds. Now note um, there's two significant figures here and two significant figures here. So that's the minimum in the question. So that's how many significant figures we can give. All right, now for the fun part. Uh, it's my favorite part of kinematics, um, oblique projection. 
Um, so it's the most complex application of constant acceleration formula uh, in this section of the vacuum study design. And it's often required that you link between the two dimensions, i.e. horizontally and vertically, um, using constant of time. Now, time is going to be constant in both directions because it's a scalar, uh, whereas the rest of them, so uh, displacement, velocity, both initial and final, uh, and uh, acceleration are vectors. So they're not going to be the same in all directions, but time is. Um, so remembering the differences between horizontal and vertical motion is really crucial uh, in understanding the bleak projection. So examples include uh, projectiles being released on an angle that is not zero degrees or 90 degrees. So everything that is between those um, constitutes a bleak projection. Um, and finally, the use of trigonometry is often required now. Um, physics assumes uh, that you know trigonometry uh, to at least a U10 math standard. Um, so I'm not gonna go through uh, all of that. I expect that you should know it. Uh, if you don't, you should probably teach, uh, ask a teacher. Okay, practice question four. Cody fires a missile at an angle of 30 degrees from the horizontal off the edge of the cliff at a height 30 meters above sea level with a launch velocity of 250 meters per second. Calculate the range, the same thing as the horizontal displacement of the missile when it hits the surface of the water. Four marks, four minutes may take a couple, uh, it may take three to five minutes, I suspect. Um, so pause the video. Um, do it properly, take your time about it, because um, it is a bit of a complex question, and get back to the video when you're done. All right, so now that you've had an opportunity to do this, um, let's go through what I'd do. So I would start with the vertical direction. Um, you don't have to, but uh, you probably should, because you're going to need um, the time taken in the vertical direction um, to find the range. So that's kind of the way that I'm thinking. So let's get all our initial values. So S is going to be minus 30 because remember from here down to here, if we define upwards as positive, that's going to be uh, a negative value. So that's why it's negative 30. Uh, so it's going to be 30 meters times that 30. We've got acceleration acting downward as well. That's minus 9.8. And we've got u as this value here that we've calculated. So we've got, um, using our trigonometry, we've got 250 launch velocity multiplied by sine of 30 degrees uh, is 125. So that's how we get that 125 there. So moving on, we have to find something uh, that we can use to calculate the time given all of these initial values. So I've gone with this formula. S equals u2 plus half at squared. Um, so we can substitute in the values and then solve for d. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to substitute all those things in. Uh, and what we'll find is that we have the quadratic. Uh, so I'm going to solve the quadratic using uh, the quadratic formula, because that's what's expected at VC physics level. Um, and we get this kind of ugly thing when you put it in, um, but that simplifies down to 26 seconds. So uh, what we need to make sure of is that when we're selecting this value here, because uh, there's a plus minus there, you can't choose one that gives you a negative result uh, because time has to be more than zero. So in this case, it has to be 26 seconds. So horizontally, we do the same thing as we did over here, uh, which is uh, 250 multiplied by cosine of 30 degrees because it's a horizontal direction. And we get that ugly-ish number uh, of 125 root two, which is about 176.77 meters per second. Then we can have all of this. Uh, and because uh, we know that this is going to be the, a constant throughout the whole motion, there's no acceleration, a is zero. And we know the time because we've got it from here. Um, we can use S equal, we can use this formula again, but because a is zero, then essentially you're getting rid of that part. So it just becomes S equals to UT. Does that make sense? 
uh, and what we get is this value here. Uh, and you've got to put it in um, to this form here because we've only got a maximum of two significant figures. Um, so that's the answer of 4.6 by 10 to the 3 meters. And the range is actually a scalar. Uh, we don't have to give a vector. We can say to the right, for instance, but you don't often need to. All right. Uh, now that should say B, so ignore that. B. Uh, Cody finds that the actual range as measured by a GPS tracker on the missile is less than was initially predicted at 4.2 by 10 to the 3 meters. Evaluate the suitability of the constant acceleration formula in this scenario and give one reason that the range was measured as less than predicted. Three marks. It's an explanation question, so it may take you about four minutes. Um, but again, try find something that gives you three kind of points or three things that answers the question. Uh, which should constitute constitute those three marks. So pause the video, uh, do the question, and come back when you're ready. All right. Now that you've had an opportunity to do that question, uh, let's see what I would say. First thing I would say, and uh, make it exceedingly obvious, uh, is that Cody has found that the range predicted by the formulae are not representative of the actual range of the projectile. So I'm saying here that um, what we've used clearly isn't good enough, but there's, there's a significant difference. Um, and so there must be an issue with the formula that we've used. So this could be due to a range of factors. So I'm acknowledging that there might, there's gonna be more than one. Um, however, the most significant is likely to be due to air resistance acting in the direction opposing the motion, slowing the missile down, some of which is in the horizontal direction and hence falling short of the, project, of the predicted range. So the key here, is this because uh, even if it's slowing it in the vertical direction, you're going to still have the same range. It's going to just going to be kind of a flat up projectile rather than say that uh, or steeper. Uh, you're still going to have this range as the same if it's slowing down or speeding up in the vertical direction. Um, so it is really important that you mention that it slows down uh, in the horizontal direction and that it opposes the motion. Uh, because that is what air resistance does. Uh, now the link here is that it falls short of the predicted range, which gives us our next point. As such, for this scenario where air resistance may be significant, these formula may not be suitable given that they do not account for this force. Um, air resistance is a force that provides uh, it's a retarding force. Um, and so this is kind of the link back to the suitability of constant acceleration formula. Now you could say even more than this, you could say that um, air resistance should be included in formulae uh, so that we get an accurate result next time, something like that. Um, that would be uh, a really good answer, but this will probably give you three marks. So kind of one for each of the paragraphs. Okay, congratulations. We have finished the lesson, um, big lesson. We covered a few things. We did uh, a review, I guess, of constant acceleration formula. Um, we did the kinematics approach. So that's the, the way to, the proven way, I should say, to uh, tackle those nasty kinematics questions. I don't know, I wouldn't call them nasty, but perhaps you might. Um, and we looked at the application of formulae in kinematics uh, to the vertical projection, to horizontal projection and oblique projection. And just make sure that when you're doing these, it's practice for homework or in SACs, um, that you're making sure you know which one of those three you're addressing uh, and what each of them entail. So in our next lesson, we'll be looking at all types of energy. We're gonna have a look at impulse and momentum, uh, Einstein's mass energy equivalence principle. Uh, and we'll probably also touch a bit on springs. Um, so that will be a really big lesson. So hopefully you'll be able to tune into that. Um, thanks for your attention. Hope that you found this lesson interesting, that you learned something new. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me, uh, you can go to the Air Learners page. Uh, so airlearners.com and you can find me on the tutors page under my name, Noel Brasher. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, I look forward to seeing you soon.